My name is Trina, and I live in St. Petersburg, Florida. That's perfect. And I'm addicted to coffee enemas. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, here we go. White coffee, why not just warm water? For the past two years, Trina hasn't been able to function without her daily coffee enemas, a procedure where liquid is injected into the colon to clean out the lower intestine. Her addiction is so intense, she does up to four every day. Four a day. How do you have time to do anything else? My initial reaction was, my God, that's disgusting. Oh, the husband knows about it? But I tried it, and now I'm addicted to coffee enemas. From the first day I did them, I've pretty much been like... <laughs> oh, the husband's in on it too! From the first day I did them, I've pretty much been like... Whatever's going on, I'm doing at least two of these a day. I don't care. Come on. Four times a day, Mike and Trina fill a bucket with coffee. A hose attached to the bottom delivers the liquid to the lower intestine. It's a whole bucket. It's not even a cup. It's just a massive amount. Yeah, so there's no scientific evidence of benefit of coffee enemas, and scientists have actually looked. There's actually one or two small trials giving people coffee enemas. I'm not joking. So they're giving participants either coffee regularly uh, top down or the coffee goes bottom up. And they measured some antioxidant metrics in the blood. And they basically found no benefit, at least uh, by those measures of, of either administration uh, route, oral or rectal. They also measured the amount of caffeine in the blood after the enema. And the level was much lower after the enema than after drinking coffee, which is expected because the absorption is not going to be nearly as efficient. But of course, this depends on the amount, right? If you're having buckets of coffee, at some point, it's probably going to level out. Though neither of them drink coffee, Mike and Trina spend up to five hours. <laughs> they don't drink coffee. Why? They don't like it. It's not good for their health to drink it, but bottom up is cool. Mike and Trina spend up to five hours every day prep. Up to five hours with this stuff. So you basically don't have a job. You, what, your whole life, do they have kids? Are the kids doing this too? I'm sure people doing this will report all kinds of anecdotes that they feel better because that's always the way it is with things like this. Maybe they have constipation or some GI issue and that's why they started. So there's other ways to address that. And in some cases, enemas are used medically, but it's not with coffee, right? It's with either water or there's some oils that are sometimes used. I do think it is just really kind of gross. Gross, I think. Yes, the mom thought it was gross and now she started doing it too. Over 100 coffee enemas a month. In four hour period, I probably did nine or 10. Like I, like I, there and was a, a time. 24 hour period? Oh yeah, there was a time when I got to a point where. <laughs> the husband is just finding out how far gone this is. I like a finer, almost espresso grind. And I feel like that saturates the coffee solution more with caffeine. I like it thicker. No, they have like a special taste. It's like at Starbucks. You have it with mocha and uh, cream macchiato. What do they call it? The crappuccino? And there are reports of people who have problems, who have complications of doing this. Colitis is one thing that's sometimes reported. So colitis is an inflammation of the colon. Also pain, bloody stool, burns, perforation of the colon has also been reported, and infections. They won't travel or leave the house for long periods of time. They do have kids! Are they just taking turns? One stays with the kids and one goes to do this stuff? Ah. Drinking coffee destroys your body, tears it up, ruins it, and doing a coffee enema restores your body. Actually, most of the evidence points to benefits of drinking coffee. There are some caveats. People who have insomnia avoid drinking it, especially close to going to bed. People who have high blood pressure sometimes that can affect it. And some people who are just very hypersensitive can get jittery. But in general, we see good health effects, lower risk of disease, lower risk of mortality with coffee intake. And there's no evidence that taking it uh, through the, the back door provides any benefit. So this is something that wouldn't be encouraged. If somebody insists on doing it, you'd suggest doing it with another liquid, with water, with a more inert liquid. If they insist on doing coffee, it, I would suggest being very careful with the temperatures and maybe trying decaf in a last resort um, attempt to tailor this towards safety.
My question is why? If anything, there's evidence that the digestion of the protein would be better if the meat is cooked because it helps denature protein. It's easier for your digestive system to break it down. But the main concern with doing this is the risk of food poisoning. So salmonella, E. coli. I know there's specific dishes like uh, steak tartare and sushi that use raw meats or raw fish. Those are prepared in very specific conditions of hygiene and preparation that reduce the risk of contamination. And even then, sometimes there's issues and there's contamination. And doing this at home randomly, not knowing what you're doing just to create viral content, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone I care about. Cook your meats properly. Staring at the sun? I'm staring at the sun with my eyes wide open and a big smile on my face. Wide open. He's squinting and blinking like crazy. Yeah, because it hurts. Can I ask you why? Have you heard of vitamin D and melatonin, melanin? I have. Do you know where they come from? The sun. They come from the sun, and you can get a tiny bit from the sun hitting your skin. But if you want a lot of it, the only way to get it is through your open eyes and into what's called your pineal gland. Have you heard of that? Um, is that like the third eye? Yeah, the third eye, which is a, a pea-sized part of your brain in the, in, the, in the very center of it. Yeah, this is mumbo-jumbo. Melanin is produced in your skin. It's got nothing to do with staring into the sun. Vitamin D is also produced in your skin, so it's completely unnecessary to stare directly into the sun to get vitamin D. And melatonin actually goes down with sunlight. So melatonin is the sleep hormone. In the morning, you're exposed to some sunlight, the melatonin comes down, you're awake at night, no sunlight, your melatonin goes up and you're sleepy. So it does help during the day if you're exposed to some sunlight for that normal circadian peak of melatonin at night. But you don't need to stare directly into the sun. There's no need to do that. The truth of the matter is, there's not one proven case of anyone going blind from staring at the sun. There's a lot of reported cases of damage to the eyes and to the retina uh, through sunlight exposure directly, like looking at the sun. They even have a name for that. It's called solar retinopathy. Retinopathy means disease of the retina and solar obviously caused by the sun. This sometimes happens after solar eclipses. So people are staring at the sun too long before and after the eclipse, right? And I guess some religions do this as well, so it's related to that practice as well. So in this report, for example, they describe four patients who were sun gazing, that's what they call it, and all four suffered irreversible visual loss. They found hole-like lesions in their retinas. And more than a year later, after the exposure, the patients still saw a glare, they saw spots, and their vision was down to six out of 12 in both eyes. So I guess if he means that there's no cases of people going completely blind, like Ray Charles blind, maybe he's right, but there's plenty of damage. Also, there's many cases where people have issues with their vision after direct sunlight exposure, then they stop with the sun gazing. It reverses in some people, in other people, it's irreversible. Wouldn't recommend this practice to anybody. So I'm cooking up some NyQuil chicken. I've done this in the past. I've heard about this. I think it was a TikTok trend some time back, the NyQuil chicken. So NyQuil is cough medication. And usually I use about, you know, four thirds of the bottle. And uh, if it's your first time. Four thirds of the bottle is more than the bottle. That doesn't make any sense. Unless he uses a bottle and another third from a second bottle. He probably means two thirds or I don't know what he means. I guess I'm the idiot. I'm checking the math on a dude cooking with cough medicine. Uh, if it's your first time doing this, you can get away with using about a fifth. Season that night. Okay, so that looks absolutely disgusting. And it's dangerous too, because when you heat up these medications, it can concentrate them. It can completely change the pharmacokinetic properties. So it's not going to work the same as when you have the medication in its original form. The normal dose of NyQuil is one cap, one little cap full which is about 30 mils, 30 milliliters. He poured most of the bottle on there. That's about 10 times the dose. So this is incredibly dumb. Symptoms of NyQuil overdose include difficulty breathing, blurred vision. I guess he can join the other guy from earlier. They can both stare at the sun. Hallucinations, insomnia, liver problems, seizures, dizziness, and anxiety. And a large overdose can even be potentially fatal. Oh, it's absolutely disgusting, too. I hope this fad is dead. This is a Clabber milk jar that I haven't washed for more than two years. <laughs> I 
This can't be serious. Uh, so, jar that he hasn't washed in two years. Somehow I believe that. It contains the vaginal cultures of two females and one female's breast milk. I don't wash it. I leave it. No, this, this can't be real. This is a skit, right? This, this is not. This is a bit. Tell me this is a bit. The vaginal cultures of two females. I like that he didn't even specify if they're human females or cows or what is he talking about? I feel like I'm going crazy. The bacteria can ferment the next batch. Oh, it's the raw milk fad. Yeah, I've heard of that one. You spit it out in the batch. The spit from your mouth will help it ferment properly. Spit is a great uh, fermenting tool. Then you put a cloth or a loosely fitted uh, lid on top. Then you put it in some place room temperature, dark for about three <laughs> or four. <laughs> he put it in his shoe cabinet. <laughs> there's no way this is real. Look, there's all the shoes in the box and gloves. There's no way this dude is for real. This is a comedian, right? Somebody in the comments is going to tell me this is a character. But I guess this is revealing that you can't even tell anymore if it's a character or if it's like an influencer because these influencers with these fads, they sound exactly like this guy at this point. See, this happens when it's a real hot place and it wasn't even hot. But I don't like when it separates like this. The top now is like the best quality sour cream. Separate the sour cream. It's vagina and spit yogurt. Oh, this is disgusting. You hear that gas? That gas build up? So now this is clabbered milk. Yeah, guys, there's no way this video was serious. But the whole raw milk fad, we went over it. There's a whole video we covered all the frequently asked questions uh, last year. Basically, it's a contamination hazard. And I've seen reports of new outbreaks that are popping up now with these fads because gullible people see this stuff on social media, this absolute platinum nonsense, and they just start repeating it. I think RFK Jr. is a fan of raw milk. Of course he is, because he doesn't believe microorganisms cause disease. He doesn't believe the flu is caused by the flu virus or if AIDS is caused by the HIV virus. He's stuck in the 18th century and there's no nutritional benefit to raw milk. Pasteurization, the most common procedure in the US, heats up the milk for like 15 seconds and it's not even that hot. It's not even boiling. The most common procedure is at 72 degrees centigrade Celsius and they've measured nutrients and raw milk and pasteurized milk. It makes no meaningful difference nutritionally. It also makes no difference for lactose intolerance. They've actually tested that. There's a trial that took people with lactose intolerance, gave them either raw milk or pasteurized milk. And if they don't know which one they're getting, it made no difference for their symptoms. This fad of the raw milk is based on something called the appeal to nature fallacy. This idea that if it's natural, it must be good for you. This is pure pseudoscience. All kinds of poisons are perfectly natural. Bacteria and viruses are perfectly natural and so was dying of infection a while back before we figured out hygiene and antibiotics and other advances like pasteurization. The only somewhat interesting data on raw milk is a link between consumption of raw milk as a small child, as an infant, and a lower risk of allergies later in life. And it's not clear if that's actually caused by the raw milk or if it's something else about those people's lives living in a farm, being raised in a farm, or something else about the conditions of their environment. And that link is specific to exposure during infancy and in young children. So it's got nothing to do with 30 and 40 year olds drinking raw milk by the gallon to improve their immune function. There's no evidence to back that up. And I would never recommend giving raw milk to a child because that's exactly where the risk of contamination and all the sequelae are going to be highest because it's the most vulnerable population. I've been practicing this for the better part of the last 20 years. And so what is this grossness in that jar? Particular situation right here. This is aged urine. This is about six. Oh months. my God. So this is a bacterial culture he has there. This is about six months, maybe a little bit longer, give or take. It's got that nice brown tint to it. And then of course, oof. Gnarly. Smells like ammonia. Yeah, because bacteria convert the urea in the urine to ammonia. So this is literally a bacterial culture. This is a lab experiment he has there. Basically, urine inside our bodies in our bladder is uh, sterile. It's aseptic. There's no bacteria in there. But on its way out, either contacting the skin or once it hits a surface, could be, in this case, the jar. I suspect this jar wasn't exactly sterile, wasn't exactly a lickety spit clean. And so now you have bacteria and you have a growth medium where they can effectively grow that's 
nourishing for them. It has some nutrients in there that they can consume. And so they're just going to multiply. And he left it in there for six months. I've done this experiment many times in the lab. You take growth medium and you put some bacteria in there, a very small amount. And sometimes overnight, the liquid is cloudy because the bacteria multiply very quickly. So six months of this, I can't even imagine the zoo that's in that thing. Parasites, it's good for your gut microbiome. It's He's not going to drink so this slop, is he? Oh, we all know he's going to drink this. Power. I just feel it in my muscles. It really gives me a lot of clarity and energy. But I have it open and we're talking about it. So, of course, we can drink a little bit and see what happens. Yeah, why not? Ugh. The first thing that we get is it's very gnarly smelling. However, once it goes... Yeah, because you're drinking an infected liquid. This is brain damage territory. And I was laying into the raw milk folks. Next to this, the raw milk guys are like Nobel laureates. It ultimately is topically. So you put a little bit in your hand there. And then you just rub it on. Oh, he rubs it on his face. <laughs> I guess rubbing it on your face is not as bad as swallowing it. It mixes with your own pheromones and it smells like perfume. Oh yeah, I'm sure the ladies love this. Smelling like old infected urine. I'm sure it's a killer with the ladies. And I get a little testosterone boost just from having that much urine all over me. Feel energized. <laughs> <laughs> Write that on a t-shirt. I feel a testosterone boost from having all that urine all over me. I can't believe I have to say this. Urine is human waste. Your body threw it away and you're shoving it back in. This is pure nonsense. This can cause electrolyte imbalances. This can strain your kidneys, having to filter all this waste again, and it can cause kidney injury. Do not do this. Just drink some water or some tea or some coffee. Through the mouth, please. Top down with that coffee. <laughs> all right, I'm done with this. I'm tired. Here's a lot more on raw milk. All of the science, check it out. I'll see you in there.